What's up guys, Doug Polk here and welcome back for another episode of Apostle Hands and today we're going to be taking a look at a hand where Apostle makes a big laydown. There are a couple interesting aspects to this hand, uh, I think the hand itself and then also some of the commentary seems a little bit suspect to me, so let's go ahead and jump into the action. We're just degens and like gambling on gambling. <laughs> and we like it so much we won't even put money to it. No, well how about a, how about a cocktail at the end of the night? Uh, although it's going to be a wash, both of us are going to completely Too win. Too late. Too late. It's not even close. How does it, it's not even like somebody's like ahead of somebody else. You know what? Whatever. You're right. It is too late. You're fired. You're fired. Get out of here. Well, so is that in addition to the cocktail at the end of the night we're probably already going to have? Yeah. It's a second cocktail. That's wow. super standard. All right. So Mike P here makes it 55 to go with Ace King. Okay. Our hand begins with Harlan, I believe, straddling this up under the gun to $10. And the action is now on Mike P who looks down at Ace King suited. Obviously, this is a very standard raise, and Mike does decide to go ahead and make it 55 bucks to go. Now, AC in the hijack looks down at 10 7 suited. This is certainly a hand that you're just going to want to be folding. It's way too loose to play, but he does decide to go ahead and make the call. Now, on the button, JD looks down at 7 6 offsuit, which is also clearly a fold, but he decides to make the call as well. The small blind gets out of the way, and the big blind looks down at pocket 8. It's definitely a hand you're going to want to be playing, and you're mainly going to want to be calling in this situation, but I don't mind mixing in a 3 bet every now and then. This player does decide to make the call and now the action over to Harlan with his middle pair getting pretty good odds here in the straddle I don't mind him deciding to call and see a flop which he does and let's take a flop and top set or set already oh for a God. suit the and last the eight in the eights. deck wow. and then gives Mike pair Mike P top pair this is sick AC and JD, draw. JD with, with, a, with gut, a gut shot, with a gut shot. there will everybody be blood everybody has something good this is what we've been waiting for good good excellent and Harlan is in this so uh, but he's pretty much dead would bend his showdown 60% of the time with just a 2 get it action Dan indeed so let's check this out it does check around to Mike P who's going to bet 160 AC flat calls the 160 over to JD it's a little pricey to get in there for a gut shot you start doing that a lot you're basically going to be hemorrhaging your stack and he does find a fold back over to sue with a set now look this yep exactly that's my boy blue you got to get it in here because here's the deal you got a sizable bet by mike p our pre-flop aggressor you have a snap call by ac that means you are against some potential large draws and i want to extract maximum value or take down the pot right here if i just flat and these guys bink their draw on the turn i have nothing but myself to blame and we're not going to play that game so Soup does find a ship here. Elabrella in the house. Much love, girl. And then over to Mike P, like, what the F? And, you know, he knows that Soup Soup's, like, not a player who should be doing this light. Like, Soup Soup isn't just trying to make a move here. If he's shipping, he's got a beast. But Mike P also has a beast, right? And he's thinking, like, dude, I mean, do you have Ace-King beat here? Because other, other than a set... There's not really a, a, a there's not an open ended straight draw out there, right? Yeah, Mike's gonna fold. I mean, yeah, he is. I mean, the problem is, is like, and I I can't put my opponent on on calling me pre with king eight, king four, and he folds. Yeah, and I AC's mean, gonna call. Whoop whoop for soup soup. <laughs> the sixteenth street crusher. Well played, Brad. Well played. Sacramentans would understand that joke. And now over to AC, who's just like. Why? Why? Why you do yeah. this? The, the flop comes king eight four. So a lot of players flop a piece here. We've got Mike P with top pair, top kicker. Pocket eights moves in the lead with middle set. We've got a flush draw here for AC. We've got a gutter ball with the seven six, and Harlan has middle pair. This is actually as much of an action flop as you can really get. The action checks to Mike P who bets his ace king in the flop. Definitely the standard play here to be betting your top pair, top kicker for value, and he decides to go one sixty. Uh, which is a reasonable sized bet here for the pot. It's also sort of important for us to note the stack sizes here at play. Of course, we have a $10 straddle, so effectively $1,000 would be 100 big blinds. We see that most of the players here are on between two and 4,000, and pocket eight is by far the smallest stack, which is 800 bucks behind. After Mike decides to bet, 10-7 student now is a bit of an interesting spot. I don't mind mainly calling, but mixing in some raises, and you definitely want to be bluffing with these hands from time to time. You can certainly have hands like pocket eights and pocket fours, so you do get to bluff here sometimes as well. You can't go too crazy because that's not many hands for value, but you can definitely have a raising range that will also put some players behind some tough situations. It is important to note, though, that Mike's range should be fairly strong when he bets the flop into four other players, even though it's a pretty good board for the pre raiser to be betting, especially when he goes this size in the flop, it's not going to be a very good opportunity 
opportunity for Mike to bluff. So in this situation, you should be a little bit more careful than in maybe some other spots. After AC decides to fold 7-6 Austin now has a bit of a tough spot here. Uh, he does have a gutter ball to the nuts, but there's a flush draw. So he only has three actually pure outs to the nuts. Uh, and especially given that he doesn't close the action, I like a disciplined lay down here, which he decides to make. Really could have just made that discipline lay down pre-flop though. Would have been a bit better. Anyway, middle pair has a fairly easy fold here. And now the action's back over to Mike. And this is a, a situation that's a little bit complex. Uh, there is another player behind that does have $2,000. It's a bit deeper. But at the end of the day, it's just simply too likely that the player who called this preflop is going to have some kind of draw. If this player does have a flush draw, he's incentivized to jam to try and win a fairly substantial pot and also eliminate opponents. So this is a situation where with top right top kicker, even though you might not be the most happy and every now and then you will be toast you're still going to probably have to make the call there are maybe some games with some very nitty players that you could consider a fold it would be a very tight one indeed but maybe with some extensive history that's possible uh, but it's certainly not the standard play and so this hand i think is maybe a little less suspicious than some other ones but still shows that mike has the ability to make a really good read but the reason I'm showing you this hand is what Mike does now combined with some of the commentary. So for starters, when this guy goes all in, let's see what Mike does. He does the classic hat bend slash tilt down look at his crotch. In fact, Mike really likes that move. But now let's focus in on the commentary because I think it gets a little bit weird. And you know, he knows that Soup Soup's like not a player who should be doing this lightly. Soup Soup isn't just trying to make a move here. For starters, when he makes a comment, Soup Soup shouldn't be shipping this lightly here. Why exactly is that? The pot is huge and the guy doesn't have a massive stack. He should absolutely be looking to get it in at least somewhat light here. It's even possible he thinks his top pair might be good enough to go with that. He can also, of course, have some flush draws. Then this guy chirps in from the side. Oh, he's going to fold. Right? Yeah. Mike's going to fold. How do you know 100% that Mike is going to fold here? It's such a definitive statement. He's going to fold. Right? Yeah. Mike's going to fold. Like, not even interesting. He's going to fold. You know, and it's almost like it's part of the whole Mike's a god, he knows what you're doing thing. But how are the commentators able to be so sure and able to frame this discussion in a way where when Mike has the, the worst of it, but a good hand, he's going to fold. But when he's got the best of it in a bad hand, he's going to call. I also feel these commentators are justifying these plays for the audience and for Mike, really. You know, I can't put him on King 8, King 4. I guess, you know, I guess, you know, he can't be an open ender. Not really. A, 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 there's not an open ended straight draw out there, right? Yeah. Mike's on a fold. I mean, yeah, he is. Wow, makes the fold. Thanks for joining me here today for Postle Hands, and I'll see you guys back again very soon.